Thanks for sticking around, guys and ladies. Uh, I'm Patrick from Dodo Case. Um, for those uh, who don't know, we've been doing cardboard VR stuff um, since like two hours after Google announced it at the I.O. event. Um, <laughs> we were like the first, the first ones to, to hop on um, making this a, a product that people could buy. Um, we, uh, we recently did a Kickstarter um, with Tony Parisi to fund uh, the development of some virtual reality features into the Glam platform. Um, DIY VR, do-it-yourself virtual reality. And also, actually, in, uh, uh, a component of that was also bringing, uh, is this volume all right for everybody? Is this working? Yeah, OK. Um, we also had a leap motion mount that you could build right into the cardboard. So you could do all the like, sexy hand gesturing stuff, uh, plus hands-free because we had this cool hat mount thing, um, and it was uh, it looked kind of cool. So, anyway, um, what I really want to like espouse here today is that like, this is the homebrew moment for for virtual reality. There are like two billion people walking around with smartphones uh, that are actually virtual reality devices, and they just don't know it yet. And all they need to transform those devices into VR is a cardboard box and a couple lenses. That's, that's pretty amazing. So um, great things happen when you drop barriers. And um, one of my favorite stories is during our, our Kickstarter, we had a, um, a guy from the UK. He was a 15-year-old kid. His name is Matthew Timmons Browns. He's got a great website. It's right there. You can go check it out, the Raspberry Pi guy. He makes, uh, he makes these video tutorials on how to do stuff with the Raspberry Pi, which is this really simple computer. And he reached out and he was like, hey, I love this idea. I want to make a telepresence virtual reality controlled robot using uh, the Pi to Go robotics platform. So this thing all in, not including the smartphone, costs a less than $100. And this is a 15-year-old kid in the UK building a virtual reality controlled robot that costs less than $100. I mean, that's, that's the power of making things accessible and open and um, getting lots of people thinking about uh, virtual reality and uh, new ideas of what we could do with it, solving problems. I really want to you know, inspire people here, hopefully, that you, know, you don't have to have a lot of money to get into this. It's going to take a lot of mistakes. It's going to take a lot of experimenting to figure out all the things that are going to make virtual reality really stick. And you know, a million people with $20 can achieve just as much, if not more, than a few people with billions of dollars. So don't be intimidated. Build the future you want to see. You, know, um, you guys and ladies in the room are, and hopefully watching this uh, podcast, you really have the skills to make this uh, possible. right? Um, so. You know, we've, we've done a lot to uh, get rid of the hardware barriers for people to get their hands on virtual reality, um, but there's still a lot of software barriers. Uh, we, heard, we heard a good amount about that uh, from Tony and the others presenting. Uh, you know, it's expensive and difficult to get the tools. They're not, you know, you're playing in other people's walled gardens. So what can we do to drop those software barriers? Well. You know, we think that the, this DIY VR revolution that we're trying to champion should really have a, an open technology stack. We want to see VR be more like the internet than a game console, you know? Uh, the internet is a powerful thing because it's this open platform that anybody can publish to, that, you know, the tools are free to use, you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you're in and you're going. Um, so, you know, we want to make the tools for creating these VR experiences a lot easier. And um, <clears throat> we think the platform is going to be a whole lot more powerful, live up to its potential if it's built on an inherently interconnected system. You know, these kind of idea of going between mobile apps on your phone is, is really, you know, siloed. And it's going to be difficult for VR to, I think, be the powerful medium it could be if the experiences don't flow into one another. Um, and so I, I think that's really important. Um, also, you know, there's more web developers in the world than any other type of developer. So if we build these tools that you know, this community can use to, to start building basic virtual reality experiences, we're going to have more, more people 
experimenting and figuring it out and making the mistakes and, and that'll help accelerate things to a whole, you know, whole lot. We'll get there a whole lot faster, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So that's, uh, you know, why, we, why we're a part of helping fund uh, the VR development of the Glam.js platform. And if you want to check it out, it, you, can, you can go to glamjs.org. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a developer, so I can't really answer technical questions on it. But we have started dog fooding kind of the platform, and we're going to do. Um, <laughs> so this, this is sorry, yeah. So you, you know, the, you, well, in summary, in summary, like you, you know, virtual reality deserves an open and free future, and it'll be a way more powerful um, technology. It'll, I mean, it will it will shift from being a technology to really being a media and a medium of human exchange if it is open and collaborative instead of locked down and, and controlled. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that everyone was getting their minutes for the internet on these little shiny CD things, and AOL was, you know, the internet belonged to AOL. I mean, that, you know, nobody likes that future. It slowed things down. Luckily, we got past it, but, you know, it's, it's the risk of having closed platforms. So, um, I'm going to do a little demo. Today we, uh, we pushed into production the latest um, version of the Dota Case virtual reality app on, on the Android platform. So if you want to get it, you can go to that URL. We built, uh, we built the app in using WebGL and the, and the Glam tools that Tony's been working on. And it's uh, running inside a crosswalk. So it, it's a native app, but um, let's see if we can get this demo working. It is built with uh, WebGL. Uh, all right. Let's see. Okay, we got the camera. Um, so the basics. The, this, and I, I apologize ahead of time. This is a little bit. The camera resolution is a little bit off here, but we'll uh, we'll we'll make do. So um, as soon as you rotate the the application or rotate the phone, you'll enter uh, virtual reality mode. You'll see the the head tracking. Uh, working, you, you, what you're seeing there is a, a bunch of planets. Each one represents a category of apps. So if we look at the uh, at the games uh, planet, and then we touch the screen, they'll zoom in on the on that set of uh, apps, and they'll start to present themselves in a way that we can select them. Uh, this is forward, home. If we want to zoom back out. And go around, and so these are. Uh, we've kind of pulled together all of the virtual reality applications on the Android platform in one place, so people can find them more easily, um, and uh, you know also start learning about these these tools. So um, I encourage you to. That demo is a, a little hard to see, so I encourage you to go check out the app if you if you can, Bitly uh, Dodo VR app, and. Uh, I wanted to spend the second half of the talk uh, looking at, you know, how fast is virtual reality going to get here? You know, we've heard a lot of numbers, um, a lot of exciting stuff, you know, 500,000 cardboard viewers out there, and it's been just about six months. That's pretty phenomenal. Um, it was uh, just for kind of a reference point, it was Oculus is acquired two years after their Kickstarter, and they had sold 75,000 Oculuses. They hadn't actually shipped them, they'd sold them. So, you know, for, for reference, like, that's a huge difference in number, right? So, if you just took those two data points, the, it seems like things are really accelerating. Um, what I like to look at, and I've done this in a couple of presentations before, is, you know, virtual reality is gonna, is, is the next kind of format, or not, I don't even call it a format, it's a, it's a me, it's a, it's the next medium, right? So we had books, we had written word, then we had radio, then we had television, each thing added another kind of dimension of interaction or, or, or uh, you know, had its own unique things, and then the internet. And those have been kind of the major mediums of exchange and, and media categories. Um, and so virtual reality is the next media category, how fast did those technologies transfer into becoming mass, massly adopted? So uh, let's look at the radio to start with, right? Um, interestingly, the radio, um, 
the first radios for consumers were uh, made from cardboard uh, oatmeal tubes. So you're looking here is a diagram from, from a government document that was like handed out because everybody wanted a radio, but they were really expensive. How to build your own radio at home, kind of DIY style, right, in the like early 20s or whatever. And uh, that cylinder thing right there you see is, is actually an oatmeal cardboard tube. So the radio uh, in 1920s started to become a consumer technology. It was around before then, but it was really used as like a wireless, uh, you know, like a, a, a wireless telegram. And you know, like you see this pattern emerge too, where like the, the latest medium kind of tries to like copy what came before it until people figure it out. So the radio was like, oh, you know, people were used to sending letters. Well, now we can send letters faster. We'll send them using this radio thing. And, um, you know, it wasn't for a couple of years until people really figured out, oh, the real consumer application for radio is, you know, building, adver you know, building stations and broadcasting music and, you know, news and all that kind of stuff. And it took uh, 38 years to reach 50 million uh, users of radio. Um, and in today's dollars, a radio back then cost three hundred to four thousand dollars. You'd see why you know, people would want to build their own. I mean, drizzling three hundred, you know, three hundred to a thousand dollars is like kind of where VR, uh, you know, expensive VR stuff is today. Um, the television came around in 1939. Um, actually, a lot of the same players in the radio space were the ones who saw the opportunity for television. Um, first consumer television sold in 1939 for $10,000. Um, hugely expensive. It took 14 years to reach 50, 50 million users. Um, the internet. First really publicly available consumer version of the internet, 1991. Took four years to reach 50 million users. And I really I like to pause here and think about the kind of analogies between uh, where we are with VR and smartphones and also where the internet was in 1991 because the PC, I think, was really this uh, important enabler of the internet. You had enough people with PCs at that point um, that the internet coming around just at that right moment and people only needing to add a small piece of technology to get on the web like, it was like a flash. It happened so quickly, right? And so if you look at today, there's this mass adoption of smartphones and kind of this cardboard box is almost like the router of the 1991, right? It's even cheaper than a router. But, it, you know, it's just a small additional component and, and you've unlocked this whole new massively interesting um, experience. And it's almost like, you know, the, the, the other thing that I like to think about and it's, I find interesting is, you know, the browser on PCs also kind of was like this Trojan horse into like taking over your PC, right? Like the PC operating system used to hold like an iron fist on the whole computer industry. And then the, you know, browser came along and now people, that's all they want to use, right? The internet is like the killer application for your PC. Well, maybe VR is going to be the killer application for your phone. Maybe that's like the sneak attack on the phone operating system. I don't know. Um, but anyway, moving on. So... What is that? What is that? If you notice a trend here, each one happened like three times faster than the last one. Um, so, you know, we've got smartphone-based virtual reality. It's super consumer-friendly. It's re it's like you know ready for prime time. People, you know, I can hand it to my grandma. I can hand it to my mom. They try it on. They're like, wow, this is this is awesome. Um, it's not confusing. Everyone's got these smartphones. So, what does that mean? Um, if we look at the timeline, July 2014, how long is it going to take to get to 50 million users? It happens three times faster than four years. It's like 18 months. Like, that's nuts. If that happens, incredible. I mean, you could see the path to how it could, could happen. I, I do think it's going to happen. Um, but it's, you know, we're at 500,000 now. If it's exponential, it, you know, two billion smartphones in the world, it's actually a, just a small fraction of the smartphones in the world to get to 50 million people using VR. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I think we're going to have everyone come up. Uh, 
now and uh, going to do a group discussion. But um, I'm happy to uh, to answer questions until the point when people are ready to come up. So, oh, also I've got I've got some swag for the first two people to ask questions to incentivize you. Two DIY VR hats. Yes. Oh, that's our address. 2525 Third Street. Good eye. We got uh, here. You get a hat. <laughs> Ready? Whoosh. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good question. Hat for you. Um, so our VR viewers, we've gone through actually three iterations. Um, the first one was based on Google's design. Uh, the second one, we really wanted to figure out how to solve the problem of input. The magnet uh, button on, the, on Google's design only works with about four Android phones that have the compass in the right you know, quadrant of the phone. It's not very, it was also very reliable. So we figured out a capacitive touch button mechanism. So when you click this button on the right, it actually touches the, the, the screen and acts as like a finger touch. So when you look at something and then you click this button, it can select it. And it works with any phone that has a touch screen, you know, which is basically all smartphones, right? So, and then, um, well, let's say we did three and a half versions. And we did our developer cardboard kit for the DIY VR. This is all in the span of like six months, just so people get a reference. We did like three product iterations in six months. We also published a beginner's guide book, which you can go get from Barnes and Noble. It comes with a, a virtual reality kit. And we did this, and we did our uh, app store so that people can find the content more easily. Uh, so it's been a busy six six months. But um, yeah, and then the, so the DIY VR cardboard developer kit has uh, both the magnet and the capacitive touch button and the leap motion mount on the front and then comes with a hat mount, which uh, I've got around here somewhere. So you can, yeah, sure. So the, uh, so this is uh, our hat, our, 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 we call it the trucker hat mounted display system. Um, so you just uh, throw your, uh, hat, your hat brim in like that and then, um, Put it on, and I need my, is there a VR viewer over there? I think I forgot. My, oh, no, here it is. It's hiding. So then your, your viewer just goes like this, and boom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and you can slide it and adjust it. It comes in and out, and it's got input, like it's got cutouts for both the input mechanisms. And then this was our third version, which is designed for the promotional and marketing. Um, it, industry. So if you you know you want to you got a piece of content you want to show people, uh, and you want to hand out VR viewers pre-assembled and everything, it comes flat packed in a box and just pops up like this, and boom, you got yourself a virtual reality device. Takes. So we have uh, on our website there twenty five dollars. Go to case dot com. So any other question? I mean, I think you guys can keep asking questions because they're going to bring up chairs and this ha this will happen. Yeah, in the back, over there. Uh, so the, qu the question was, what did we build our app store on? Um, so we, uh, for the application, we used Crosswalk and then it's, uh, it's, it's uh, built using Glam. And so that's you know, Tony can better answer that question. Maybe he can, he can answer it in more detail when, when he comes up on the stage here. But is it, it's a crosswalk. Um, it's running inside a crosswalk. So it's basically a browser. You know. uh, I'll let Tony answer that question. Oh, so how, how similar is that to any 3D modeling software? Is that what you asked? Yeah. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Tony answer, answer that question because he, he'd know better than I would.